Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Guys, if you're getting the uh, but to, this is Future Governments and Cities, What Roads to Smart Sustainability, Accessibility, and Inclusive Society Will Look Like. And I'm really proud to be joined by amazing leaders from all over the world. And so we're going to get into the content pretty quick, but I want to make sure that the panelists have time to introduce themselves. You can find their bio on, um, you know, on, on the agenda. It, you know, it's available. But my name is Deborah Rue. I'm joining from Virginia in the United States, and I'm the CEO and founder of Rue Global Impact. And we focus on making sure that everybody can be included. Uh, very important that everybody be included and tech for all. So very excited about the conversation. So let me go next to Maya. Hi, I'm Maya Zuckerman. Um, I'm from San Francisco. Uh, I am the COO of Lumen. We're a strategy firm, uh, but I'm also uh, I also work with the Global New Mobility Coalition, which is a side project of uh, the World Economic Forum uh, around mobility, inclusion, uh, micro mobility, and how do we create smarter cities. Uh, and I'm also doing my MBA around circular economies, and I've been advocating for regenerative and circular economies for a few years. Um, and my last little thing is I'm also the co-chair of the diversity and inclusion uh, subcommittee, uh, part of the IEEE ethical line design. We look at how do we move standards of AI and AS um, into reality, into actually how we, um, how we actually code and create technology in the world. So excited to be here. She's also a science fiction writer, which I thought was super cool. So uh, welcome, Maya. Yuri, let's start with you. Let's go with you next. Fantastic. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. How is everyone doing? I'm uh, Uri. I'm uh, originally from Mexico, but I also have a Danish passport because I lived many years in different countries, among them Denmark. I had a lot of experience in the financial world with over 10 years and uh, also in the digital marketing over 15 years. But uh, I decided to come back to Mexico five years ago uh, to, to found uh, Grupo Bien Ahora. We're the largest wellness event and leading wellness organization in Latin America, Mexico. And that's what we're doing at the moment. I've been here for, for five years now. I'm really happy to share today with you. Welcome, Yuri. We're excited to have you here. Richard, you, you want to go next? Sure. My name is Richard Streitz, and I'm the COO of Ru Global Impact. I work very closely, obviously, with Deborah Ru on a daily basis. Um, she already spoke about our firm. I'll give you a little bit about my background. Um, I come from uh, the film and industry and entertainment industry, actually, to, um, to the accessibility and inclusion space. I was a Walt Disney Imagineer for many years, building immersive and uh, large-scale environments, both large and small. Um, and accessibility and inclusion was, abs was absolutely hypercritical in the development of those. And that is what really has provided a great deal of awareness. And uh, as after I had left Disney, I, I got into this profession um, uh, to, to this to date. Uh, and so that's uh, um, so that's how and where my background is and where I come from when speaking about smart cities, having built many around the world and having lived also uh, like you're in different countries. Um, and I'm in Richmond, Virginia. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. And certainly last but not least, uh, Marco, you have the floor. And Marco, uh, you you win the prize of not being muted first. Congratulations. <laughs> I thought for not. sure I was gonna win that one, but. <laughs> so we are the first country to have the Pfizer vaccine, hooray. hooray. Well, apart from that, I am um, the founder of Freedom X, which is a basically an Amazon for the socially excluded. Um, I used to be homeless. I have my own TV show called Get a House for Free on Primetime TV in the UK, where I give homes to homeless families. And that led to the rise of Freedom X, where we're able to build the technology using blockchain and AI to feel the, the transparency is they can actually see who you're giving the money to. And there's total inclusion, which is an amazing thing. Um, I'm also a number one best-selling author of three books now, and I am a filmmaker. So I'm, I'm uh, from a similar industry to, from Richard, but I'm very new to the industry. Um, but I've made a couple of films that have made a lot of difference in terms of social revolution. 
And I also just released a Hollywood film called Legacy of Lies with uh, myself and Scott Adkins starring in it. It's a spy thriller. And we've just won our 24th Best Film Award. Congratulations. That's amazing, Marco. And of course, it is um, Sir Marco Robinson, which, uh, you know, in the States we think is cool. So um, so what we're going to do is we're going <laughs> to we're going to do round robins and we're going to uh, I'm going to ask questions one at a time and we're going to go all the way through. And um, certainly happy to try to uh, address any questions that come up from the um, from the participants as well. So, Yuri, we're going to start with you. What are the biggest challenges that developing countries will face in the future when it comes to building an accessible and inclusive society? Okay, well, um, I think first we need to define what we mean by future. So let's say 30 years from now. In that case, it will be uh, 2015. And uh, the biggest challenges uh, that we will face in developing countries, I think it will be, first of all, something that probably everyone has been talking about already, but it's an aging population that's going to be less able to use and access technology. And even though artificial intelligence make it easier for all the elders, I say because you will be 60, 68 years old. So we will need guidance not to feel lost and support not to feel lonely. Um, there will be less young people to care for us. In most countries, we will have an inverted population pyramid. Um, a second big challenge will be the, a sharper economic and social contrast between uh, big groups. And there will be a lot of groups of people left with little or no access to healthcare and technology. Um, for the third one, I will say it's a further conglomeration of urban areas. So uh, living less developed regions in the countryside um, uh, without focus, without development. However, COVID has pushed people to move away from the big cities. So that is an interesting trend that we could build on. I think that the pandemic has had an interesting impact and it's already tested some of these challenges. Excellent, excellent points. I, I also think it's very interesting that I know that we we um, keep saying that developing countries can learn so much from developed countries. And I actually think in the future, we're going to learn. Um, I think that's going to reverse. So um, very interesting points. Maya, I know that um, th th hopefully your technology, is, I know that you froze, but so yeah, glad can that you you're me? back. We can hear you and we okay, can see good. you too. Okay, so let good. me ask you the next question. How can we build smart communities that tap into our innovations? And at the same time, do why do a lot of innovation projects fail? I know you're an expert, expert in that um, particular um, yeah, point. Thank you. So uh, I'm going to start with um, the second part of the question is why do innovations fail? And uh, one of the interesting things that um, we've noticed also our work with Lumen is that and then there's even a word here now in, in, San, in San Francisco in the Bay Area, it's, there's a lot of innovation theater, um, but then there's a lack of implementation because implementation is really hard. It takes a lot of work and innovation is fun and exciting. And you know, the money's there, the, uh, the investment is there, but then when you actually get to innovation, that's a, that's a full contact sport. Um, and that's where our uh, humanity shows up. That's where, um, that's where a lot of the issues with actually human behavior show up. How do we actually do work together to actually implement it? And also who gets to innovate, I think is, a, is also a, a conversation when we're not including everybody in that conversation, um, then we're innovating only for the innovators. Um, and so I think that's part of what I'm seeing and, and, and have lived here in, in San Francisco for 17 years. Um, and, and I think that's that's for every level, I think from the app level to the city level. Um, and, and the change takes longer and it's not as easy. Um, and to tap into communities, I think a lot of um, more of the modern cities have been built around cars and have not been built around humans. Um, so it's actually transitioning into uh, how do we actually build around humanity? And with COVID, like one of the biggest uh, movements that we've been tracking, especially with the Global New Mobility Coalition, is a concept of the, you know, 15-minute city, the open streets. All these conversations have actually led to deeper inquiry into, well, when we open the streets, are we inviting the the communities to be part of that conversation? When we um, open streets, is, is that 
done in an equitable way. I mean, there are communities when you just say, oh, let's just open the streets for everybody, but we're not considering safety and, and mobility and how people move around that area. So if we don't actually include cities into this conversation, sorry, communities into the conversation, who actually lives there, we're creating more uh, issues than, than actually solving them. I mean, I live in San Francisco and we have a very visible encampment uh, issue, which is, is heartbreaking because you have people living on the street outside my house and there's no way for us to even interact. There's no healthy way of how do I help the person without saying, well, this is okay to just build camps everywhere on the sidewalks and then I can't walk. There's all these issues that are happening. And if we actually have a conversation and what I would love to help people, but I don't know how. And there, and it's very hard because we're not communicating as a community, we're separating ourselves into sectors. I'm in the tech sector, somebody else is in this sector, and this is not a healthy community. This is sectors and silos. So I think actually engaging more with people and bringing in their genius, because we can bring solutions together, is part of how, how we move from the, as I said, innovation theater into the full context sport of implementation and change. Well said, and I agree. I, I think we continue to not have the all of the stakeholders at the table. Um, I know that we're really working hard on changing that, but still we're not seeing it happen. So um, it's, you know, women are a perfect example of people that aren't being uh, meaningfully included. And then you go into the other diversity groups, you know, including the ones that I really care about, uh, people with disabilities and people that, you know, are aging and often into disabilities as well. I think we have a lot of opportunities. Um, and I uh, I know that when Marco speaks, he, he might want to um, talk a little bit about the homeless um, comments that you made as well, because I know that's something that's important to him. But let me go to Richard now. Richard, why is it so important for society to build inclusive design into a smart cities and IoT networks for people with disabilities in the aging communities? Richard, um, you, you now win the second place prize of um, speaking with your mute button. <laughs> of course, of course. <laughs> Um, thank you for the question. The um, as smart cities are certainly being uh, realized and created gl uh, globally, uh, smart smart devices and their integration uh, um, is and, and into tech into the technical ecosystems is what's absolutely critical and and becoming more and more essential as the development of these uh, devices have become so advanced, especially over the more recent years. Um, it is it is become, um, it is being important to integrate them into the environments as they're being created. Um, certainly, uh, um, and, and in, in doing that, realizing that there's both sort of the micro and macro view of the development of these and, and why that's important for um, the elderly and the person with, with disability community. Um, micro being, of course, those devices and engagements that are important to the uh, small physical environment around the individual as they're engaging with the environment. And then the macro, them engaging actually with the larger ecosystems that exist into in, in the larger environments, whether it be their house or the community and, and city and so forth. Um, this is all becomes really important to, um, this integration becomes really important to allow them to be able to engage in society. This is what allows them to be able to navigate freely um, within the community, uh, to be able to, to go to work um, and, and to work in the working environments. Again, going back to that micro, um, to shop and to, to play. Um, what's important about that is it allows the individuals to establish a, um, a sense of feeling and a, a feeling of belonging in the community. Um, and that's what is what should be the end game for all of this um, is is important for the individuals to feel that uh, that they are active and contributing members into society um, that are being created by these uh, um, by these smart cities. Um, so, you know, you know, as uh, Maya, I think you said, the, um, the the trick is the devil is in the details in regard to actually executing that uh, the philosophy is good. Uh, I think it's important that we understand the um, the nature of, of having the dialogue and making sure the stakeholders, which has already been said, incorporated into the, the design and development process um, so that there is a, a, a true um, uh, integration with those individuals being able to, uh, to work within the environment. Um, so I, I think those are uh, some of the, um, 
some of the more critical aspects as to why it's important that when we design and think of these environments, why it's important that uh, um, inclusive design is considered essential uh, for the aging communities as well as the persons with disabilities communities. Great points, Richard. And I think sometimes designers, designers can be very, very clever, very, very smart people. And I think sometimes they think, we don't really need to include the communities because we got this. We understand what people that are aging needs and we know what your needs are if you're, you know, a person that doesn't speak the 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 native um, language. And but I think that continues to be a mistake. We actually have to be very deliberate about including people. Representation matters, considering all the intersectionalities of these conversations too. So great points. Marco, let me turn it over to you. How can we bring together the different stakeholders to assure we're building smart, sustainable, accessible, and inclusive societies? Marco, you are on mute. Marco. The causality of this. Can you hear me? We can now. Thank you. Okay. It's a great question. It's a big question. And I believe to, to really conquer this, we have to go to the causality of this problem. There are now 1.6 billion people homeless. There are double that are sleeping on people's couches. And of course, because they don't have an economy of their own to be able to succeed in today's world. This is the problem, which is the cause of a disconnected society because people are operating on a survival basis rather than a thriving basis. So what you've got now is a situation where people don't really have the time, but more so they don't have the inclination to help someone else less fortunate because they are so suffering themselves, so to speak. And the greatest action we can take as humans is when something is good for us, good for the person we're helping, and also good for the greater good. The question is, how do you connect all that? And the other issue is government. The governments of the cities in the world, of the major cities in the world, are mostly corrupt. We have to face the facts here. You know, we can take a very good example of the pandemic and the recent award of government contracts to government people that were connected to the government without an independent I forget the word now, but contracting, subcontracting basis. So everything is basically skew whiffed. The distribution of wealth is completely unbalanced. And the only way we're going to address that is by going to the cause of the situation. Now, technology, I believe, is pretty much one of the only ways we can do that as a society because it includes disabilities, it includes non binaries, it includes everybody without having to have that problem with being scared or feeling unsafe in San Francisco when you're trying to help someone on the street, whether they've got COVID or whether you don't know who they are, they might want to rob you, okay? So I believe that in technology, we should have an application where everybody that is excluded and included is verified on where they are in society, where they want to go and where they've been. And also when you have that transparency, we can go outside and we can actually verify people with this app and we can say, right, these people need our help and it would be great if I could help them. Now, the other facts that I will also mention on this on this message, on this question is, is that charities are not answering the problem. And the reason that charities are not answering the problem is because 96% of charities, that of money that goes into a charity from donations is lost in the organization in internal costs. Now we can identify those as corruption or other things, but basically it's not getting to the people that really need it. And I'll give you another example of that. British government aid sent 17.6 million pounds to the South African president about 10 years ago, and he used the money to build a new mansion. So, you know, this is what, this is what the problem is. There's no transparency in the blockchain or the chain supply chain of where that money goes. And as a donator to charity, if I'm giving to charity, I want to know where my money's going, but more importantly, is it making a difference? Now, individuals want to be included because actually everybody is a genius. Everybody's a genius, but we are conditioned in society not to be a genius. We are conditioned to be enslaved to an employer, to a government, and be in a system which does not serve most of the people. So we've got to be empowered. And of course, the key to that is education. So on this application, there has to be a way 
that we can educate everybody to get them on the same page as everybody else so they can have access to the same tools and resources that everybody else in the elite bracket has that is that they are not able to access right now because the reason people are in poverty really is because of their education and access to those tools. Now, I know this because I used to be homeless for many years. I slept in the car, I slept in the car park, I slept in the in the park. You know, my mum was sexually abused, physically abused. And in those days, we had less access to those kind of things because it was shunned upon to even tell the rest of the family what was going on. Now, I think we've moved on a great deal where we can actually share these things, especially with women and with feminism movement now is a huge movement now. With the Me Too movement is a huge movement now. Black Lives Matter is a huge movement now. And these divisive, although they appear divisive right now, they're becoming more inclusive as people become more educated and aware of them. So these are my thoughts, and I'm working on that right now because I think it's the biggest problem in the world we, we really do have. There are people dying right now that we don't even see, that we can't even help because the money that is to help them is not getting to them and they're not getting the education, the resources they need. And the first thing people need is food, water, and shelter. And these basic needs are not being met. And when that's not being met, no one can succeed in society. Simple. I, and I, I thought I was uh, talking to somebody at the Uni United Nations about some of these problems. And I thought it was very interesting that something that they said to me was that um, with the re whenever people are in refugee situations, and first of all, it's really frightening because the average stay in a refugee camp is now 20 years. And so they're asking for food, shelter, but they're also asking for Wi-Fi because people understand that if we can get access to technology, technology and connectivity and Wi-Fi, we can actually try to take care of ourselves. So it's just, I just wanted to add that to your amazing comments as well, Marco. So let's talk about this from the lens of technology a little bit, because of course, technology as we humanize it, make it work for solving some of the largest problems that we have as human beings, including taking care of our precious planet. Uh, technology is very, very important in these conversations. So Yuri, I'm going to start with you again. How can technology and artificial intelligence intelligence cope with some of these inclusion challenges that we've been speaking about? Well, that's a very interesting comment by, by Marco, by everyone. And um, it's, a, it's a big challenge because, uh, as I mentioned before, we want to have an aging population. We have an aging population, so uh, technology is the only way forward. But we also need to think how to distribute better the human uh, human capital, intellectual capital. Um, so with the pandemic, we were forced to accelerate the use of internet by the elderly. And in many countries, uh, governments offered computers or tablets for children. Unfortunately, that was not the case in Mexico. Uh, however, even when the elderly were forced to adopt the, the use of internet and apps, they felt very lost. They felt quite lost. Even with apps that might seem as simple as Facebook. Uh, we experienced that as an organization because we launched our event, our wellness event for free in Spanish in all the Latin world. And we found that for the first time, many elderly people joined uh, because they were isolated. However, they had a lot of challenges just to open a video on Facebook. So while we can work on getting uh, artificial intelligence to cope uh, with inclusion challenges, we need to constantly create simple educational programs for the elderly and create supporting groups one to many so that they won't feel lonely or lost. Uh, as I mentioned, some governments uh, were able to provide free tablets, internet, educational programs uh, with incentives for people um, with less resources. So that's something uh, that has to be more available uh, for all the countries. And finally, I think we should incentivize the distribution, as I was mentioning, of uh, non-artificial intelligence, intellectual capital to the different regions to enforce uh, the human aspect. That is another trend that uh, we saw with the pandemic. We had a better distribution of brain power moving towards the countryside. Uh, so that's something that uh, I think governments should incentivize so that uh, we can distribute better uh, people and support uh, the groups with less uh, access to, to all these tools. Great points, Yuri. And, and I think it's a, just such an important point that you made. You made so many important points, but that the governments really need to be paying attention to what's happening, you know, as people's, uh, uh, you know, are moving to the countryside more. We're seeing that happening in the States as well. And so let's pay attention to what's happening and what 
people are saying and what society is saying. So excellent, excellent points. Richard, I'm going to go to you next. Why is it critical for there to be follow through and or checkpoints during smart city design and production to ensure that we actually have sustainable um, and accessible projects when it's completed and inclusive? Well, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, great question. Um, you know, having the proper checkpoints uh, is absolutely essential in the design, development, production processes. Um, certainly, uh, looking at the design process in the um, in the initial stages, when you're sitting in a room with some individuals and you're coming up a uh, blue sky, um, coming up with ideas, uh, um, seeing what sticks. It's important that that phase to actually already be considering how does this affect the larger, broader part of the population in regard to the to their end user experience and whatever that is, whether it's a product and environment or so forth. Um, that's hypercritical because if that starts at that early stage and, and goes through all the stages I'm, I'm going to talk through, you never miss a beat in being able to or, or, or being forced to have to go backwards and and um, and apply an overlay over the top of something that's already gone uh, further along. Um, so, so certainly doing, uh, you know, in the, uh, that initial phase of being able to talk through is, is very, very critical. Um, um, the other, uh, sort of the next step of that is, is in the design phase is being able to deal with focus groups. Uh, when you're, when you get an idea that is far enough along in the process to be able to invite individuals in and talk through with focus groups about what you're looking to do, um, and bring those stakeholders into, into the conversation at that point to get feedback at a high level so that you can start making decisions that become valuable. Um, this not only allows, again, for a better user experience at the end, but also provides um, some economic savings in the, for the uh, uh, group organization that's doing the development um, or the design work in, in being able to make that process very efficient, again, so they don't have to backtrack. Um, so once this, the, that, that process and that maybe iterative going back and forth, uh, once that process then goes through and you start getting engineers and, and you start moving into production, at that phase, again, having, um, uh, having um, uh, 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 being able to produce mock-ups, you, you get the engineering process to a stage where now you'll be able to rough create some uh, first articles uh, or, or a mock-up of, of, a, of a space. Um, and, and then you bring, again, people in, have them interact and engage with the products. Uh, this process is, again, iterative, but it's very important in maintaining those checkpoints as you go through all the processes. Um, this process then it goes uh, even further as you start doing um, the, the construction or, or actually creating your, your, your um, uh, after the prototypes, you go into the first article of production if it's a product. Um, and then you start bringing people in and, and getting um, from experts and leaders uh, in, the, in the field. In this case, we're talking about accessibility and inclusion and get their input from looking at plans and models that are being developed. Um, and then as construction happens, having them go into as a final stage into the actual environments and, and, and work and, and um, either, either work or engage with whatever is being done. The, these are all very critical steps to maintain um, throughout the process. What's also uh, great about incorporating all of those touch points is it allows a sustainability of the process. If, if, that, if those checkpoints are built into your process to begin with, you can't fail at the end by making sure that you've achieved an absolutely um, engaging, immersive, accessible, inclusive environment um, to the best that you can, uh, given you know, at, at the focus of the time with the technology and, and, and the, the uh, um, strategies that are known at the time. So I, I, I think by incorporating all of that, it's really, really important to, to maintain that. And sort of as an overlay over all of that, I think incorporating the UN SDGs, uh, Sustainable Development Goals, is again, another really great way at those checkpoints to sort of see where you are and if you're able to, um, to incorporate those principles and practices and ideas into the methodology um, and, and the production processes. All of that, I think, when incorporated at the end of the day, will provide you with a uh, with a, a very, very accessible and inclusive pro a product or project. And you will note that as every single step he went, he had, you know, where you were engaged with the users, the people that actually, you know, you want to use the technology or to use the smart community or cities. So uh, let me... Um, 
let me ask about some fears and issues. Maya, let's go to you. Do you fear that issues with AI ethics and lack of diverse data sets could impact future efforts with smart, sustainable, and accessible and inclusive societies? Yeah, that this is something we uh, definitely talk about at the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee uh, with the IEEE. So the IEEE Ethical Aligned Design is just one set of these ethical principles. There's about, I don't know, probably over 50 or 60 organizations, including Google and others, writing these principles. Because one of the biggest issues that we're facing is um, who's coding? Uh, do they actually include people when they're coding? And what is a code used for? Uh, there's a great film called Coded Bias um, by MIT, uh, about an, MI, one, uh, an MIT student who uh, was a person of color and found out that her, her AI couldn't even read her face. So when we're actually developing cities where uh, certain communities are not even there in the development stage, we're facing a lot of issues. And I'm bringing this because that's an extreme case, but people are being, um, well, we've got cameras everywhere. We've got uh, databases of people that are misrecognized. Um, we have all these actually safety issues that are happening because of these technologies. And in, even if we don't look at just AI or even looking at the uh, recent uh, trials of the vaccine not being inclusive enough of people with allergies, of people of color, and that, uh, of people of color, and then all of a sudden we're seeing that there are issues with with that vaccine with, with certain communities, and these are life and death issues. And we, as we go back in, in time, we're seeing things like having um, uh, non gender diversity when developing things like uh, seat belts and and developing those for uh, male with bigger uh, bone structure versus female. I mean, there's there's so many of these examples of why this is so important, but when we move towards AI and we really are, you know, the, the technology, technology train is leaving the, the station, but we left most of the human population behind and only uh, a few get to decide, get to develop, get to design it and get to code it. I think we're facing a, a pretty, problematic uh, and, and actually scary area where we're not educating people on how to even use, how to be more media um, media savvy. Uh, and this isn't everything. This is in building cities, but also how we consume our media. When we have in America, half the population not even believing reality. Like this is, this is such a problem. So uh, trying to get um, trying to get all of those uh, factors in when we're developing. I think it's it's up to us, the people, uh, and, and, and me including, yes, I am in the business, but to actually call that out and also create environments where more voices are heard, where there is more inclusivity, where there's more diversity, even if it's not in the code, in the way we code itself, but in the interactions between the people who code and the people who are gonna actually be using these technologies as the end user. Um, and, and also more transparency, Marka talked about it, you know, whether it's supply chain transparency or development transparency or, you know, big issue with uh, technology and transparency is all those long um, agreements that we're all signing in just to use any of these applications. And nobody's going to go and read the 90 page uh, uh, document for every app we're using. So I think the that is going back to what Marcus said, the education part, inclusivity part but also making it easier for people to understand how to actually interact with these technologies, how to interact with these uh, concepts uh, and, and include them in the process. Uh, one of the outreaches that we want to do with the diversity, um, equity and inclusion is like really ask ourselves, who are we not speaking to and who are we uh, speaking for? Uh, and having that level of responsibility in people who are actually developing these technologies to have the have the training to bring in these conversations. And they're not easy conversations, they're extremely complex. But I think we're at the time where we live in such a complex world and training ourselves to deal with complexity and ambiguity is important because that is actually where diversity is. Diversity is complex. Um, we're now in this wonderful world where, uh, where we used to uh, speak, our language used to only include certain genders and now we have this beautiful array of new language that we're learning and we and it, we get to actually ask people who are asking to uh, use to be to be a, um, approached with these different pronouns what they want to be uh, uh, 
talked as like how do how do they actually want to be defined and i think that just that is such a great learning um experience for all of us and i think we should be i think the, one of the things that could really help all of us as we are developing these technologies as we're speaking to other people is actually yes there's a lot of fear but there's a lot of promise but the promise is in the inquiry and inclusion and and not only building uh, tables and inviting people to the tables by going to other people's tables as well. So I think that's the other thing. We all want to kind of bring people here to our table, but the humility is to go to other people's tables and ask, you know, tell them what we do, but then listen. Uh, so I think technologists, all of us, um, myself included, learning more how to listen, learning more how to ask questions, and also using our power uh, to change legislation, to change policy, to not let this slip because part of the power we still have is voting and changing things and being active in our communities, in our local municipalities, in our states and countries. Um, so I think that is part of how we change this and move from fear to hopefully more promise. Very well said. And I think also uh, what I'm seeing and I've also done myself and I, a lot of other people are doing is um, you, you have to really, um, you know, challenge people that are not including others. So I don't, uh, you know, I, I know a lot of male allies that will not speak on panels that only have men and don't have any women, um, or if it's all white women and there's no diversity. And um, so more and more as leaders, we also have to make sure, not just to say, pull up more chairs to the table, but actually to make sure that we're holding each other accountable at the same time. Um, Marco, I'm gonna turn it over to you and I'm gonna just let the audience know. After Marco, we're gonna do one more round, but it's gonna be more of a, a tight li lightning round to make sure, I wanna make sure all of the um, panelists get to you know ha do the question and also if we have any questions from the audience. But before we go there, I wanna make sure that um, we hear from Marco. Um, um, Marco, how can we use technology to support disenfranchised communities? I know you've done some amazing award-winning work supporting homeless people with the blockchain technology, and you've talked about that a little bit, but, um, you know, is there more that we can do to really use technology to make sure we're supporting disenfranchised communities like the homeless or people with disabilities and others? And you're on... You're on mute. I was on mute saying you're on mute, Marco. So go off mute. There you go. Okay. Um, I think the panel's brought some very good points up. And um, one thing I'm going to say to remind everybody is this year, 2020, has been a year of fear mongering. It's probably the greatest fear year of my life that I've witnessed. And I'm sure a great deal more have witnessed that. And you can have a conspiracy theory, you can have an, a different theory. But the facts are that we have been bullied by governments, especially into a situation where we are afraid to leave our houses, we're afraid to talk to people. They even termed it social distancing, not physical distancing. So this is also in a language of fear. And if we, you know, as intelligent beings, we've got to see through this that this is a pandemic of fear as well as a virus. And I will leave everyone to make their own conclusions about that. Um, but one thing I will say is governments should be afraid of their people. People should never be afraid of their governments. And we live in a society where I would say most people are afraid of their governments because people feel they have no choice other than to obey what they say. And it's only through a critical mass of people that we can change a government and change a policy towards helping disenfranchised communities and also, you know, uh, whole communities that are not disenfranchised but yet are dis disabled by the society we live in. We live in a very um, perverted society that really only helps the wealthy. It doesn't help people that come from poor backgrounds. Unless you have got that adversity courage that gets you through those those walls but right a lot of people don't have the luxury to feel that way because they're they're, they're being they're in situations where they don't they, they can't do that because they're being bullied or they're basically in a situation where they're trafficked or something like that so you you know we, we're talking about a very big issue here 
Um, and the only way we can do that is as, as really with technology is if we look at uh, an example of Bitcoin. And the reason we're all here is because of Bitcoin. You know, <laughs> I have to tell you that Bitcoin has got no founder, no office, no company. You know, and that is still around. And we all know that governments have been trying to close that down for many, many years. And now governments have been moving their attitude to saying, well, you know what? If we can't beat them, we're going to join them. And Bitcoin has been talked about in a more favorable way now because basically, partly, it can't be shut down because it's distributed technology. Now, if you go to the average person on the street and say, listen, have you heard about Bitcoin? How many people are going to say no? How many people are going to say yes? We all know most people haven't got a clue about it. So, again, this is reaching, like Maya talked about, it's a reach out campaign of an education that we have to make sure that we are reaching out to those disenfranchised communities and educating them. But we've got to do it in very simplistic ways. Right now, it's too complicated. There are too many layers to reach the right people. And disenfranchised communities are so frustrated to get the right help to fill the right form in, as Maya said, there's forms and forms and forms. People haven't got access to Wi-Fi, and the only way you're going to get something is to fill a form in, which is, forgive my language, fucking ridiculous. Okay, and that's the way we are. As you know, it's all about form filling. You know, and I'm going to also take you to the way that the average person has to live in a system where your credit profile has to be good all the time or you cannot buy a house, you cannot buy a car, you can't borrow money. And that is extremely perverted in the way that it targets poor people, because if you lose your job, you can't pay your mortgage, you lose your credit for six years. That's utterly ridiculous, you know? And that's gotta be changed, because we can't live in a society that condemns people for making one financial mistake. So, there has to be a huge financial incentive to, as it includes everybody, and there has to be a social incentive. But that financial incentive has to be indelible, has to be secure. And people have to understand that the average person on the street can get a financial incentive by helping someone less fortunate than themselves. That is a society I would love to live in. Well said, Mark. And sadly, in the United States, uh, family members get sick, they get cancer or something like that, and you lose everything. You lose your home, you, you lose everything. It, it's through, it, it's, it's, we, we got a lot of work here. So, all right, so I know we have about 15 minutes left, and I want to make sure everybody um, has a question, but also have a little time at the end. We'll maybe, if you want to respond to somebody else's, you that as well. So Yuri, I'm going to start with you again. So besides artificial intelligence and technology, what would be considered to prepare developing countries for building a smart, sustainable future? Uh, a great question. Besides technology, um, well, I think we need to go back to basics. You know, technology is great and it will be key to building a smart, sustainable future. But um, at the end, it's all about the decisions that we make every day. Uh, Dr. Mark Human, an internationally recognized uh, physician, has said many, many times that over 80% of all chronic diseases is preventable, which means that the decisions we make on what to eat and the habits that we have will define our health and future. Yet, um, our healthcare system spends only 5% of every dollar on prevention. Uh, so I think it, it, that has to change. We should spend much more money on improving the quality of the ingredients, the process of the production of food, uh, more education on our habits to improve the, our mental health, our emotional health, physical health. All of that has to be considered when we talk about technology. Uh, the good news is that uh, Artificial intelligence and technology, such as the latest uh, watch, intelligent watches that they're launching, have already some apps that are supporting preventive medicine. Of course, there is not enough access to, to, for people to, to, uh, to have this technology. But uh, the good news is uh, they alert you if you have an, um, something going wrong with your heart, or they can de detect high or low heart rate. They can detect if someone falls and call for help. They are, the, the latest one also has something to measure the blood oxygen, which is also very important. 
So all of these uh, good technology are fantastic technology improvements, but we need the government to increase as well the, spend, the spending on, on, on education to create a better preventive medicine environment. Um, so I think we still need much more focus on this area and so that countries can really build a, a smart, sustainable future. Well said, well said, Yuri. And I know that Maya wanted to make a comment. So Maya, let me turn it over to you. Uh, she wanted to comment on some of the things you were saying, Yuri. Yes, for sure. I mean, everything has, has been like really good conversation, but you know, one of the big things about, um, and also Marco was talking about, we have enough, there is enough in the world. And to bring up society and having more of, you know, beyond just sustainable, renewable, regenerative societies, we need to have kinder societies. Um, and to actually do that is to see that everybody's needs, basic needs are met. Um, there's a concept of UBI, the universal basic income, but I think we need to go beyond that. I think we need UBR, universal basic resources, to see that everybody's housed, dressed, has education or, or basic education, access to the internet, access to electricity, access to healthy foods. Uh, and that actually brings in the, the conversation of um, having, uh, we have food deserts in America in the, in the most, in the richest country in the world. Uh, cities can actually transform some of their properties and, 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 and uh, land into urban farming. There can be food equity for all, or even just to a level. And also that is a much better use of our resources it brings a sense of community, it's healthier, we're driving our food less, it's, it comes from our neighborhoods. Um, and it'll also beautify and bring more, uh, especially if you're, if you're using more regenerative agriculture practices, it actually enriches the soil and draws down the uh, CO2. So there's, there's a lot that can be done. I think it's, a, it's, it's being brave, um, it's uh, actually trying new things in cities. And also asking the city, like asking the people, will you help? Like if if people, like I'm seeing it in even little wonderful little plots of lands in this in the Mission District in San Francisco, people want to tend the land, give people some land, create some structure around it. People are going to show up and help. Um, you just need to ask them. I think the other biggest issue is we're not asking people what do you need, and how, and are you interested in coming and helping. And if we actually give people access to help, we'll see that there's enough, enough food, enough money, enough everything, but we're not even thinking in that way. We're creating cities around cars. We're creating cities around buildings. We're not creating cities of, around people. And I always want to bring in the nature. We got to bring nature back into the city in a way that's healthy for the animals and the other, um, the other beings that we share this planet. Uh, being around concrete is not healthy for anybody. Uh, having more trees, more even little urban forests is the way to move forward. It cleans the air, it brings biodiversity, it's healthier for us, it's places for us to walk around when we're told we can't see each other um, and, and meet in parks. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's really, one of the things we've seen through this pandemic is we've got enough, we don't need a lot, we know what's essential and we need nature and we need abundance of nature. Um, so I think that transition um, is is something that I'm really interested in in pursuing in in my career moving forward because uh, as you know as Marcus said like it, there there are solutions here we're just stuck with the haves and haves not. I agree. I, I also would like to see some of these gigantic corporate buildings that are not being used now because people are teleworking being retooled to support homeless people and people in poverty. So I think they have all those beautiful campuses that you're not using. Everybody's teleworking now. Well, why don't we use that and create some really good housing? So um, I know that we have 10 minutes left and I loved those comments. Maya, love the comments. So I'm going to um, ask Richard a question, but once again, we have 10 minutes left. So Richard, if you don't mind keeping it tight, then I can let Mark Marco also make one more comment. And if we have a little bit more time, uh, let Maya, um, you know, also, you know, comment. Um, and Yuri too. So Richard, what responsibility do designers slash engineers and politicians and other leaders have in taking, taking into consideration the universal design practices and policies in a way to really make sure that we are having smart, inclusive, accessible, sustainable, um, smart communities? Well, you know, um, I, I think what's really important about uh, 
the answer. This is actually, I think, in many ways, incorporates a lot of the uh, the items that were um, that have been brought up because there's a tremendous amount of responsibility that goes through um, dealing with the designers. And one of the things that designers have to think about when they're coming up with ideas and uh, of products or environments is making sure that they're engaging for the end user uh, uh, for the end user, and and that by definition tends to be humans. And so bringing humans into the um, into the equation has to start really at that point. If you're designing something just for the sake of a product, then it doesn't it doesn't help anyone. So keeping it human, human centric is, is absolutely critical. And that starts from the uh, original conceptual design stage and making sure that everything being designed is for um, the engagement of or, or, or interacting with a, uh, um, a human, the human end user. Um, certainly from an engineering standpoint, durability, functionality, ensuring sustainability of the items that are being used, whether the components or, or, or the materials um, is, is absolutely critical. But also uh, in, in regard to what's essential for engineers is the um, in incorporating um, um, ethical inputs um, and social responsibility. Um, safety with data. Uh, you know, a lot of these larger environments are collecting a tremendous amount of data. What's happening with the data and the safety of that and the sharing of that and so forth. Um, incorporating nature into uh, environments, you know, Maya, to the point that you were making, absolutely critical. Uh, certainly in environments that I've always engaged in, created nature has been a very, very important component in making sure that there's plenty of, of that around because it is, uh, it's, it's critical at a, at a subconscious level for us to, um, to engage as, as, as a society. Um, policymakers, uh, uh, last really fast, uh, dealing with policymakers, uh, it's critical for them to establish environments, political environments and, and, and statues and policies that allow for, for uh, designers and engineers and, and, and developers, and contractors to be able to work and create these environments without all the heavy or overburdened restrictions that prevent that making sure that we're dealing with things like environmental issues and, and that we're being good stewards with engaging with not only uh, our, our global partners, but uh, ourselves as well um, in, in, uh, within our development of our Thank communities. You. Thank you. Thank, I know, I, I know I'm Thank asking you all gigantic questions, but boy, you're doing a great job at answering them. So applause to these smart answers. Um, Marco, let me go to you. And I know once again, I'm being the, the, the taskmaster with the time, but we have about seven minutes left for the entire panel. So um, you were knighted for getting guide dogs into Malaysia and allowing them into public places, which has transformed the lives of 350,000 blind people. Um, why is it important for leaders to help transform lives of others so that we can all give back to society? Yeah, okay. Um, I think it's an incredible thing when you think about, I'm only one person. I made a 10 minute film. It cost me $30,000 of my own money and it changed 350,000 people's lives within 10 days. We made the film, we called it Are You Blind? We, we brought in a guide dog from China. We, we videoed, we filmed this person going into public places, being turned away um, in, on, on gunpoint at certain shopping malls. We got it on camera and we released it on Facebook and YouTube, we got 13 million hits in seven days. The Malaysian government telephoned me, the King of Malaysia contacted me, said, Marco, we don't know whether to knight you or eliminate you because you've embarrassed us. And what I want to tell everyone on this, on this meeting and everyone watching this is film, as Richard will tell you, film makes the most difference of any medium there is on this planet because it's got one thing, it's called visibility. The other thing, uh, the other example is David Attenborough's work showing how the plastics have damaged the oceans. Now, if it wasn't for that film, plastics would still be used pandemically and destroying people's lives. So those are two films which make a huge difference. So it's what we can do as individuals by making a film and having the courage to do it. So when I'm looking at a society, I'm looking, right, what can I do here that's going to make a huge difference? That's going to be a legacy for the country, but also a legacy for me because I need to be fulfilled doing it as well. There has to be a two-way benefit, guys, right? And if you can do that, an ex-homeless person can do that, imagine what we all could do. I'm going to quote Thomas Edison's famous quotation. If we all did what we were capable of doing, we would astound ourselves. And that's how I want to leave that. 
Beautiful, beautiful words. So now we have four minutes left, and and let me just um, Yuri, uh, let me just give you the floor. Do you want to make any final comments, and then we can just pass it around real quick? No, I I hundred percent agree. I like the comments that Marco just said about the the potential that we have through the internet and film. Uh, we, we also are living here in Mexico and Latin America a movement in which we are sharing a lot of uh, information resources for many different groups. Uh, this year, we were surprised by the amount of elderly people who, who joined. And as I said, they were quite lost, but they, 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 they somehow learned how to do it. And um, well, that's, I, will, I will just agree with that point. And that's uh, my final remark is that it's, it's on us to, to make a difference. We have the tools. It's about finding the way to do it. And a fantastic example by Mark as well. Yes, and, and we love the work that you're doing. So I hope everybody really checks out what Yuri's doing because it's very impressive. So Maya, let me turn it over Thank to you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. There we go. Um, yeah, thank you, Marco, for your work and, and, and Yuri as well. Uh, really, it's about, I think, one of the big things, and back to your question on leadership, for some reason in the past, well, maybe it's a human, a human past, we look at leaders as somebody that found themselves at the top without questioning why they got there. And I think we need to flip it over and, and look at um, role models who we want to be aspired to be uh, and, and hopefully being kinder and, and more humanistic uh, humans um, and, and really elevating those voices. Uh, and I'm seeing more, more and more groups elevating voices of people who definitely care. Um, and, and this younger generation like Gen Z, uh, yes, I'm going to bring Greta up, but there's others like Greta. There are so many Gretas out there doing amazing work um, for the planet, for young scientists. So elevating these voices, young and old, yeah, of all ages and of all diversities of people who are actually are fighting for a better planet um, and making those the rock stars and the reality show stars, not, not the very emptied out, hollowed leaders that we're seeing on the, on the television. So I think for me, it's like that is why leaders, leaders need to actually lead as by example of what to do, not what not not what not to do. So that's what I'm aspiring uh, for all of us to, to become big, better leaders, better elders and better ancestors because we're living what we do, every choice we take right now is, um, is it impacting future generations on this planet. Well said, well said. And we have one minute left. And so Richard, uh, let me turn that over to you. Well, th well, thank you. Uh, you know, certainly, I, I think w one of the interesting things, and it's it's sort of a it's been brought up a number of different times, is um, apprenticeship and mentorship and leadership. Uh, what's really critical about that is I think systemically one of the larger global issues that we've seen um, with all the problems that are happening has to do with the fact that we have a particular generation that has um, not incorporated young or, or mentorship or apprenticeships behind them. And so what's happened is they've grown accustomed and, and, and sort of power hungry with where their positions are and refuse to let go. And, it, and it's this sort of piling on without incorporating new um, um, young ideas into the system that allows stagnation. And of course, we all know what happens with stagnation you know, with just a foul pond at the end of the day. And that's sort of where we are without the influx of bringing in new people, young people, new thoughts, new ideas, this is sort of where we are and we're, we're all falling victim of that. I think it's very, very important that we em em embrace the youth, embrace their ideas of change because that is what allows development, innovation, progress, advancements of societies and cultures. Um, thank you, Richard. And luckily, uh, Serafina said we have a few more minutes so I could actually la let Marcos um, make last comments and then if anyone else would like to comment. But I was very, very impressed with this panel and also very impressed with what you all said. But I, as we've all been saying, it's going to take all of us to do this. We're going to have to support each other. We're going to have to support the younger generation. I'm with Maya. I'm an elder, and I believe my is part of my responsibility to make sure the younger generation is being listened to and heard. When I was a younger woman, I was told, you're too young, be quiet, nobody wants to hear what you have to say. 
the young people aren't going to put up with that anymore because they actually they they know this is their world and that they and they want to have a say in it. So Marco, um, let me let me give you the final words. Hello. Yeah, I'm with Maya on this. I think um, I wouldn't I wouldn't label myself as an elder because I'm so young inside and young at heart. For me personally, I think we have to speak the same language as different generations, especially Generation Z, who are discounted immensely in society. Now, I've got a, a friend who's my niece. Sorry, she's my friend's daughter, and she's 17. And she's a huge YouTuber. She started in YouTube about a year ago, and she's got millions of fans. And I went to a shopping mall with her, and all of her fans started approaching her. And I, I was so curious. What? was so magnetic about this girl. And I interviewed one of the people that was um, speaking to Chloe. She said, she just speaks our language. She just understands us. And I thought that was a very powerful statement from someone that I learned from. Because if we can talk people's language and we can, we can seek, as the great Stephen Covey said, if we can seek first to understand, then to be understood, Communication, I believe, is the greatest part of our society that we need to really work on. Once we bridge that communication gap, I believe we, we, we can have disabled people. I mean, look on the TV today in England. There were 90-year-old people getting a vaccine, and the first time they, they'd had their voice heard, but they sounded like they were 25, you know? These are so... And the thing about people who are older is they have more time to help. They don't, they don't work. They're retired. So there was a book I read years ago where I think it was to do with, I think it was, Nor oh, I mean, I'll think of the uh, Conversations with God. I don't know if everyone, anyone's ever read that, that trilogy. Um, I have. I was reading that. Yeah, I was reading that. Neil Donald Walsh. Yes, yes. I was, I was just going to say that. Yep. I love that word. And he, and he said, he had a conversation with God one day and he said, why don't you let the older people look after the children because they've got all the time. So then the parents have all this less stress you know carpooling and football pooling and god knows what and then we can do much more in society and then older people can feel they're making more of a difference because how many people love their grandchildren you know so this is just a, a thinking out loud kind of thing that we should really look at as as leaders but also we really have to include everyone and to do that, we really have to bash through this government red tape bullshit that is stopping the things that we really want to do, getting to the people that really need it. And we've got to do a lot more campaigning for that in big numbers, really big numbers. And I want to thank Dennis Garda, who's a great friend of mine, who has he's actually led this conference from the start. Denise is the hardest working person I have ever met. He's an incredible guy. An incredible I agree. Human being. I agree. An We're incredible all blessed. We're all blessed yeah. by Dennis. Totally. Thank an, incredible, you, Dennis. an incredible humanist who cares for everybody like I've never seen. But his work ethic is off the charts, off the charts. And it, it, without Denise, we wouldn't be here talking to each other and having a fantastic time, but also giving really great content. And now I've made five more friends, four more friends, sorry, that I'd never had before because of this initiative by Denise which I think we should all thank him from the bottom of our hearts and our souls for getting this off the ground because it takes a shitload of work, really. Forgive my profanity, but sometimes it's a shortcut to saying what I really want to say. Um, so I think this is a great platform to really move to bigger places, um, to, to more decentralized places, more technological places where everyone feels included and to build platforms where everyone can take part, but is also incentivized financially and socially. Well, and we also need to make sure that we've subscribed to their YouTube channel and that we're, yeah. we're using that hashtag and that we're commenting on the other panels because that's another way we can show Dennis love is by really getting behind him and making sure that we are heavily engaged in these conversations. And I saw so why you. Don't we, why don't we get like teenagers on this panel next time? Let's have a teenager a conference and get them mixing with us and talking about what they see as their language. I think that would be really cool as an idea. I agree. And Yuri, you're holding up one of those cool yeah, hearts there. So. 
Yeah, I want to send one a big award to Dennis because of all the fantastic work. This is the wellness award that we give in Latin America. We want to send this big award because he's making a huge difference with this event. And uh, as, as Deborah said, everyone has to subscribe now to, to this channel because it's, uh, it's a way we can make this movement right. bigger. Well, I'm humbled and uh, thank you so much. It's a teamwork. We have as well uh, Ilton Super and Serafim and all of you. I, it was a wonderful and inspiring session. I actually, all the sessions, but yours was a great way to finish with a, a very beautiful uh, symphony of inspiration. Um, thank you, Deborah, for, for being the leader of this panel and as well your fantastic leadership. And actually, I want to dedicate this because this panel is about inclusion. So Mark, you mentioned about my hard work capacity. Actually, it came from my father. And my father is the person that is disabled since he mostly since he was a child. So I got this capacity of work from him. And he actually never complained. I never saw him complain. And he actually he has a leg smaller than other. Part of his back is destroyed. And is still working and still pushing things. So I think these ethics of work that you mentioned in the panel, both the ethics, but as well the capacity to put things forward, because sometimes speaking is not enough. So yeah, I'm inspired, and thank you so much for for making this. And I think all of you, I think this is the sum of our parts, and actually people all over the world as well. Uh, that is uh, the idea of this. And actually, Mark, I took notes. Next time we'll have for sure a teenager or two. Uh, <laughs> so I have them around the house, but I'll make sure that they are present. <laughs> and as well, we I, I tried Deborah for this panel, actually, Antonio position to get us uh, the someone with the sign, the language sign. Right, right. But it right. didn't go on time, but actually with StreamYard, it's possible to get it. So for the future, is in my list. And I have already some some people, but we're going to do it again, probably in, in March, April. Um, and uh, you will be invited again, but we'll hopefully with a different capacity and as well. And as well, I, I want to share some numbers and please stay because this is as well a way of celebrating. You cannot be face to face, but you can share. So we we our numbers actually are astonishing. And of course, I, I was not expecting this number. So we got 50,000 people yesterday and today oh. in terms of direct access. And, uh, and over 2 million people in the last month are actually part of all the work that we did, but both in the real numbers that can be measured. And as well, of course, uh, for now we paid for all of this, <laughs> but we're very excited that in the future we might get some other sponsors that could allow us to as well push some of the panels. And as well, for instance, Deborah, you were doing a fantastic work on the areas of uh, Inclusion that I, of course, we are part of this is well, the Cities ABC platform. That we actually, I want to announce in terms of uh, in terms of a, a focus that we're going to be doing, uh, and as well, of course, we have been working with Mark to uh, support to the Freedom X project. That is a uh, is baby to to create a solution app in blockchain for for uh, people with the uh, homeless. But I think definitely both the platform Open Business Council and Cities ABC are precisely created to be what you discussed here. But of course, it's not easy because coming up with a strategy that can make both the technology and the people, it's the key thing. And I think especially uh, your inspiration and as well, all the projects you're doing are amazing. So I think hopefully we can actually do more and um, and as well help each other because this is a global, uh, like you mentioned, I think Maya, you mentioned something very important that I, I, I it stay in my mind is that at the moment we have a, a massive challenge in society is that we have people living a parallel in reality. I mean, I've put it very well, but it's a big thing. And think, thinking in the United States, which is a country I love, and especially that the what is happening is quite scary because it was partly because of the technology manipulation and right. all the conspiration theories. And I want to, I think, take that. It's a big thing. And I think we can use this for inspiring people, like Marco said, to create, for instance, what Marco did in Malaysia. It's massive because before that, probably Marco would go to jail. But because of social media, he managed actually to convert something that was amazing. And I think that's what we need to do. Use it for, I think, something more interesting that can actually help us all. So I, actually, I don't, I'm speechless. It's wonderful to have you here. And uh, let's make this a bigger community our community, all of us, because it's it's not mine, it's not Tilton or Serafima, it's from all of us. And of course, a big responsibility as well. And and Dennis, we want to help you bring sponsors too. So thank you for your work, for Serafina, for Hilton. So, you, you know, let us, I know that we're partners, but we want to um, make sure some of our clients are sponsoring what you're doing too.
It's very powerful. And Not I want to win one of the hearts. I want to win one of Yuri's hearts. So we'll, we'll, uh, <laughs> I love that. Beautiful. It's beautiful. Isn't it beautiful? <laughs> No, actually, I, I've been telling Uriel that he needs to do this festival worldwide. We might do it because yes. it's about the uh, well. Completely. No, I think it, Deborah, for sure. I think for for Cities ABC, I wanted to be one of the leaders because the Cities ABC is just as a, a, a global announcement, and we have as well with us Antonio. Actually, he was supposed to be speaking, but is 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 Portuguese. We need to find a way of pushing his English. Uh, he's in Brazil, so Antonio is bringing us a couple of cities in Brazil. Um, so you're going to have a big audience for the platform for uh, Cities ABC because he has ex that's 20 million people alone in Brazil with disabilities, and right. we have already all the interest. They wanted to come in, but we have to build the technology first. But there's a, there's a big, and I think like Marco said, I, I, the numbers of homelessness is is astonishing because there's if you put 1.3 billion people disabled plus 1.2, you mentioned. Marco, homelessness, we're talking about 50% of the planet, and these numbers are not reflected in the global stats. So, and right. I think a lot more can be done. So, but yeah, one day at a time. But success today. Woohoo! Oh, no, thank you so much. <laughs> it's, it's ours. Uh, our success is, is yours, and I think it's, uh, it's great. It's, it was very inspiring. I don't know, Wilton, if you want to say something else to Pima or anyone else, because this is as well, I think, a great wrap up. I'm very happy. And, and we still have around 100 people around the world listening to us, so they're still persistent. So I appreciate that. <laughs> you are on mood. <laughs> That's a new. <laughs> I know. It's so easy to forget that. It's been a huge uh, now, experience for me. It really has been a huge experience for me. Um, you know, I've I've done a lot of work in the past, working in and you know doing conferences and things like that but this one has been very very special it really really has you know at the end of the day the key takeaways that we've had from um all the contributors um to this brilliant event um you know i mean i just went through the list i was just astonished you know over 100 speakers and organizations involved in all the panels that we had you know and we had the minister of state for science and technology from japan we had kimiko representing you know, um, Tran Van Tung, the Deputy Minister of Science of Tech in Vietnam. And then we had, you know, Alexandra Borinikov from uh, Ukraine with very, very interesting efforts in terms of completely digitizing their, their, their whole bureaucracy in their country. And of course, the great work that Eric's been doing. I mean, Eric was, a, you know, working, you know, on the UK Smart Nation and, and previously worked with the UK government and, and the Prime Minister Cameron. And then you've got uh, Michael Stanley Jones, who's you know working with the United Nations and you know and and, and bringing the you know, digitization projects that he's bringing to the whole the whole thing. And of course, the whole you know a lot of work from Kieran Fernandez, the professor who's associate dean of Durham University, in terms of framing policy and trying to bridge the gap between policy and reality. And you know we had you know even the the minister of uh, of IT and telecoms from the government of Pakistan. I mean. This is huge. And then Jane Chan, Jane Chan, who's, you know, who, the, you know, from the government of Hong Kong, SL, on, on, on the whole, all those sort of um, um, startup um, um, initiatives. And then, um, and then, then we had, um, of course, uh, Bangladesh. We had, um, uh, what, what's her name, Jameen. I and mean, she was amazing, you know, talking with the minister the, the, this morning in, uh, in terms of the efforts that, that she's doing with Bangladesh and Startup Bangladesh. I mean, that was very, very impressive the work they're doing and the, the contributions from Edward Dinder on Huawei and, and the, you know, the work that they've been doing. Of, of course, you know, we, we've touched upon all the technologies. We've touched upon, you know, 5G. We've touched on IoT. You know, if infrastructure is very, very, very important. And then the misunderstanding about, mis about infrastructure that was highlighted in, in what we were doing. And then of course, we had some contributions from MDEC in Malaysia and, uh, and some fantastic stuff that was talked about in terms of the supply chain from Rona Morel, you know, who's working with ARC 2030 and the Princesses Trust. And then of course, a great contribution from the Chamber of Commerce and Industry for Slovakia from Monica, Monica Kocheviga. And then a great, I mean, and then we had Max Lautzenslager, who's the, who's from Iconic and a lot of the work that he's doing in terms of digital assets. 
and then you know and also the you know, digital platform that's been put together by rob wells and then of course um you know lisa, professor lisa lisa short and her her contribution and then i think the the, the one that i really liked was aiden meller and ben gorsel the two men at the forefront of uh, the two people at the forefront of um, robotics, um, you know, Ada Mello with Ada the robot, who's you know using a robot actually based on the creative side of of the development of robotics, and then Ben Gorsel with you know with um, you know Singularity's Net development of Sophie the robot, and of course the latest robot, which is the health and wellness um, like nurse, I would I would say, and then of course the contribution from Dr. Jamal Onish, who's from the um, University of Edinburgh and, and and way in which data can be analyzed and used and an ethic an ethical way of using data and Mark Buckley who's been working on the United Nations sustainable goals in terms of how society today um, needs to evolve forward, for, forward particularly on the education spectrum I mean education was one of the key takeaways is education 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 but education not in a linear flash and, and education across all of society, all age groups, all all demographics, and, and then of course, the, you know, in the final session that we had this this evening, from um, you know the, the the team, I mean, just you know, thank you very much, Maya, thank you very much, uh, Marco, thank you very much, uh, everybody for your contribution. I really, really am delighted to have been part of this, and thank you very much. No, and I think I think uh, I want as well to thank you all our team behind the cameras. So there's uh, there's Rachel, Silvia, Marco, uh, Arnaldo. They've been uh, working 24/7 all on this. They are joining us actually from all over the world, and as well uh, people in and uh, we had in Vietnam, Leon, uh, Anne as well. That we see in Vietnam right now is midnight or something like that, but they've been as well. Uh, working a lot in Guyane. So we have a quite global team. So we have people in London, uh, Spain, um, and then uh, Vietnam and Kuala Lumpur. So, and hopefully around the world. So you're all part of us. And I hope, uh, so Deborah, like you mentioned, I'm particularly interested to collaborate. And I think your thought leadership is something that touched me a lot because of your work. And actually your personal background, you didn't mention, but you have a very hardcore personal background in your family, which most of the people probably would be desperate, but you are inspiring the world and unstoppable. <laughs> so that's that's wonderful. I think the story of Deborah, I I, I I I urge everyone to listen to her interview because it's it's not just inspiring, but as well very touching. So I think there's a lot of stories like this, like you mentioned, Marco. I think your story as well, your personal story, because you 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 as a child, we were on the streets with your mother. So that's kind of something that marks someone for life. But you've been making that your strength and your energy in film, in technology, and, and in charity work. And Richard, of course, you work with one of the biggest corporations in the planet, but now working as well, what you do. And Maya, I think your work in thought leadership is more important than ever because uh, I think we need that. And as well, very sharp uh, focus on this. And of course, Uriel, wellness is key. I know it for a long time, but I think it's a key area. So, and of course, um, I, I think one of the things I took as my personal notes is. Uh, there's a lot of details in terms of putting things in practice, uh, especially when it comes to technology. Uh, Ilton mentioned the panel yesterday with, uh, of course, there was uh, with two leading people making robo robots and androids. And actually, uh, I've been actually exchanging with both the robots and it's really, this is happening. Okay, it's not in five years and uh, most of you know that we are talking. But for instance, when I start speaking with either robot last time I was in, in their studio, at a certain point, I start talking like a normal person. Initially, I was a bit skeptical, but I was literally talking for 10 minutes and he was interacting with me completely like a human, okay? So this is not in five years, okay? And thanks God, this is a robot created by a personal that is a, a, an historic personal art or an art dealer and art uh, uh, history expert and the three leading universities. But if this can be done by someone with not a huge amount of money, with three major universities, for instance, today, this is in the news, mainstream news, the French government put official uh, a new law of ethics to create bionic soldiers. Okay. Oh, so this wow. is official in the news. That's wow. Quite good. Oh, wow. On the news, and this is France, so it's public. Okay. So, so <laughs> this is. Not, I think everything we're talking in this event is not future; is very present, and of course, the the concerns that come out of this. And especially what is going to happen in the next five years is 
is uh, yeah very powerful. But yeah, yeah. I, I I think we we wrap up these. I don't know if there's any final. I, I just want to say I just want to say one thing. Um, you know, thanks to technology, I'm able to reach out. You know, I reached out to Maya some time ago, and Maya and I met years ago in in, in Earl's Court in London. Serafima I've been working with for these last few years. Serafima and I have never ever met, except digitally. <laughs> You know, and we have an incredibly close working relationship. I've met Dennis a few times. You know, Hinalda I met once, and Hinalda actually lives across the Bay of Algeciras here from me. He's literally straight, straight to the crow flies. He's five kilometers away. But we can't meet because of COVID. But we work yeah. together. And this is the power of technology. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm sitting here at the age of 60 years old, and I'm all inspired by the technology. And it, I, I, I take something out of your book, Marco, we will bring the youth into this platform. We really need to engage with them because they are, we need to hear their voice. And it's really, really powerful. And thank you for that. I really appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure. I'm very grateful to, for everyone for joining our conference, for agreeing to speak, to share your ideas, to, being, to bring in such an amazing contribution uh, to all of us. It's been really a big learning curve. From business point and from learning about views and technologies, very very inspiring. Uh, grateful to our team, as Denise mentioned, we all pulled together and done really well. And uh, what I like about what I personally liked about our conference is that we managed to cover the aspect of frontier and technology and uh, from different angles, from government uh, angles and strat digital strategies. Uh, going more into tech with more technical panels about cybersecurity or coding. And the hi highlight of this was this last panel that spoke about the most important things, I would say, about us as a humans and how can we use that technology to benefit for the humanity. So it was a wonderful today's event, and I'm very much looking forward to our next event when we all gather together and create more beautiful things. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Serafina. Thank you. Beautiful, beautiful words. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Congratulations. Thank you, so much. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. See you all in March, April. <laughs> bye, bye. Adios. Thank you. Bye, bye. Adios. Bye, bye. A pleasure. Bye -bye. Thank you all. Thank you. Okay, I think that's it.